Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? I am done ranting about Al Golden's <laughs> above average to pretty solid defense, and I'm ready for some rapid fire. Let's do it. So here's a tweet from former Notre Dame defensive back Troy Pride Jr. over the weekend. Quote, Buckner either has me lit or pisses me off, end quote. So what do you think about Troy Pride Jr.'s tweet? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think I, I, I 100% agree with what he's saying in, in a, you know, in a lack of better words. Um, but really, it, you know, what did, what did Buckner do in this game? I understand Reese shouldn't have called a, a pass play in the red zone after all that running, but Buckner still has to throw the ball and still threw the interception, right? It's like Russell Wilson's play in the Super Bowl. I, we all know that Marshawn Lynch should have got the handoff, but Wilson still dropped back and threw the interception, right? And so the pick sixes are, you know, when you spot a team 14 points, and it, that's going to piss you off. Or when a team goes up 31 to 24 and on the ensuing drive, you throw an interception and give them the ball in plus territory, that's going to piss you off. But then when you see a Buckner 10, 15 yard quarterback, you know, counter power into the red zone, you're like, this has me pretty lit. This is what we've been missing all year. That's a third, right. <laughs> a third dimension in the red zone. So I thought it was put perfectly and I completely agree with them. But unfortunately, you know, this is Buckner's first game back after serious injury, you know, having the confidence to throw the ball compared to what the offensive line looks like in Ohio State and Marshall games. There were going to be some of these things kind of ironed out, but it was like the good of the good and the bad of the bad with Buckner yeah. in that game. It's it's like, you know, it's it's very Brett Favre, basically, you know, like gunslinger Brett Favre. He could make, you know, plays that that make your draw drop in one instance and then he's throwing a stupid interception the next, <laughs> but because he's Brett Favre, you're willing to live with it. Now I'm obviously not calling Tyler Buckner, Brett Favre, but you know, that's, that's kind of what I would compare it to, you know, with that kind of swinging of emotion, the highs and lows. Someone tweeted a reply <laughs> to Troy Pride Jr. That I love. They said, I had a girlfriend in high school like that. And I just feel like a lot of people can probably relate to that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's either got me lit or just totally pisses me off, you know, and depending <laughs> on what day or maybe what minute it happens to be. But, you know, I I, I think the entirety of what we saw from Buckner, it, it definitely backs up what Pride said, like you were talking about, because the highs were higher than anything that we saw from Drew Pine, you know. But the two pick sixes were lower than anything that we saw from Drew Pine. But, you know, again, you know, like one is a deflected ball at the line of scrimmage. We saw that plenty of times from Drew Pine. That very easily could have been him. And Pine started 10 games this season. Buckner started three with four months, obviously, in between starts number two and three. Pine finished the season with a 69.3 quarterback rating against USC. Buckner had a slightly better 60. 69.5 against South Carolina, again, with 16 weeks in between starts. And, you know, Pine was never going to give you what Buckner can with his legs. You know, he, he ran for a little over 100 yards and two touchdowns all season. Pine had more than half a hundred and two touchdowns of his own, you know, and obviously five total touchdowns. So, you know, there were, there were peaks and valleys for sure. But, you know, we knew going in that Buckner was going to make some mistakes because he's still very inexperienced. And, you know, just his third start since his junior year of high school and his first win as a starting quarterback since he was in high school. So you can look at the lows, but, you know, the, the, the balance of the whole thing is there's just still a pretty raw quarterback there who made a lot of strides after being out for as long as he did. So there's 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 still a lot of a, a promise, a lot of good stuff there. But but Troy Pride was definitely right. <laughs> you know, I think everyone was riding those highs and lows along with him out there Saturday. So here's another tweet. This one from former Irish linebacker Drew Tranquil, who's of course with the LA Chargers right now. Tranquil says, in college football, offense wins championships. So do you buy or sell that, Jesse? Sorry, Unmute I'm, yourself. <laughs> I'm going through a little coughing attack here, so I hope I can. I can tell you got you got something to drink there. Yeah, I've been chugging it down, but uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, that that is a hundred percent true, considering what we saw 
um, out of the semifinal games uh, this weekend. And I think, you know, 41 to 42 with Georgia and Ohio State and then 51 to 45 in the Michigan and TCU game. And these are Michigan and Georgia were considered some of the top defenses in the country throughout the entire season. And so when I saw these scores on New Year's Eve, as I'm, you know, taking on a little whiskey drink myself, I'm thinking what's going on here because these are supposed to be the best defenses. I expected kind of, you know, some, some lower scoring, but when you're putting, you know, when all four teams score in the forties, I think it's easy to say that college football turns into, you know, who has the best offense. I completely agree. And I'll let you kind of clear your throat there <laughs> while I try to give my response. I went back and looked and, you know, it, it seems like historically, even without looking at the numbers that, you know, there we've seen a lot of offense in the semifinals and the championship games. And this, this is now the ninth year of the college football playoffs. So there have been eight previous playoff champions. The winner in the national championship game has scored at least 42 points five of the eight times. And two other times they scored at least 33. And only once when Alabama played Georgia in the overtime game, 26-23, five years ago, did the winner not break 30 points. And you said it, not only are these teams putting up those kind of points, they're doing it against some of the better defensive teams in the country, whether it's Georgia or Alabama or Clemson on down the line, I completely agree. You know, like you look at the winners of the semifinal games, the average score in the 18 semifinal of the winners of the 18 semifinals over the last nine years, 34 and a half points. So you've got to be dynamic offensively. You have to have more than one way to score. You've got, you know, with few exceptions, you'd better have a really good quarterback because the teams that have played in the playoffs have been filled with first round NFL draft picks and Heisman Trophy winners, not just the quarterbacks, but, you know, receivers as well, you know, and, and running backs. You can't be just a good defensive team because the offenses in college football have just gone to such a different level over the last few years. You've got to have skill across the board on offense. And again, you can't just be a one dimensional team. Notre Dame's getting closer with these recruiting classes that they're getting, that they're getting, they're getting, you know, more dynamic offensive players. And that's what it's ultimately going to take. Like when you talk about closing the gap, you know, turning the corner, all that kind of stuff, you've got to have those kind of players offensively. I mean, look at the, the playoff appearances that Notre Dame has been in. It's been a lack of not being able to keep up offensively, right? And so I, I, I'm just in complete agreement. I think there's something to be said to have a, a solid defense throughout the regular season, but come playoff time, your offense better be putting up 30 points at least if they think that they're going to have a chance of winning. So I, I'm in agreement with, uh, with what Mr. Tranquil was saying. Yeah. C-Mac has given you some advice. Ricola has Vicks Vapor Rub. In them. I taste so. it. It's the worst part. You get down to the end and it just tastes like you're just eating rub or Vicks Vapor Rub. Yeah, I know. I know. And uh, Spencer, sa Spencer says, Irish need to figure out NIL, be a very competitive institution with NIL. I don't know if you saw today, but Benjamin Morrison uh, signed an NIL deal with uh, a, a trading card company and he's going to go do an uh, autograph and photo session later this month. So again, there's NIL there. It's just that Notre Dame is not using the NIL the way a lot of these other schools are illegally using the NIL as inducements to get the kids to school. There's NIL there, plenty of NIL opportunities. So my next question for you, Jesse, is losing in the college football playoff semifinals worse for Michigan or Ohio State? Oh, this is a, this is an un- this is a no doubter for me. It is a worse, far worse for Michigan this year. Um, Ohio State has proven success in the college football playoff. They were the heavy underdog against Georgia. If I remember right, everyone was saying that Georgia would blow them out. They'd be a multiple score game. It wouldn't be close. I thought personally, Ohio State would keep it close. I thought they had a chance of pulling out the upset, and that almost you know came to light if a, if a field goal kicker could just kick it straight, but. You know, 
Michigan is a different story because they got embarrassed by a very good Georgia team last year, right? And so, okay, first time in the playoffs, go against the team that ends up winning it all, a very good Georgia team, solid defense, okay, whatever. This year, you get in, and everyone doesn't want to let TCU in. TCU's the underdog. And I thought Michigan kind of looked past TCU and was anticipating this Georgia matchup. And this is the best chance that Michigan has had at a national championship in a very long time, a very fair opponent in TCU in which I thought that they should have beat and they get upset by TCU. So for me, this is a big, big loss for Michigan. And, and the last thing I'll say, and I know it's hard to compare this because it's not straight apples to apples, but you know, all those Michigan fans out there that gave Notre Dame crap for how they lost in the, in the playoffs, Notre Dame had to play generational Alabama and Clemson team, right. and you're handed a TCU opponent that is, they're good, but they're not near the same opponents that the playoffs have seen in the past. And, you and they're bragging about how this 3-3-5 three, three, defense that they run, you know, is going to be so easy to run through at all this stuff. Right. How does and, that work? And so I just thought it was very embarrassing on Michigan's fact because they blew their bag on, a, to me, it was a very good opportunity to get back to the national championship this season. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's Michigan as well. I think they've reached their ceiling, you know, based on how they do things, their mode of operation. And now you look at Jim Harbaugh and there's all this NFL talk with Jim Harbaugh out there. And, it, you know, it, it look, some someone was just, you know, apparently there's a story about it close to a deal with Carolina. I haven't he seen anything specific to that, but the Denver Broncos have been in on Harbaugh. There's been Colts. talk with the Colts. There was a report yesterday saying that if Jim Harbaugh is made a legitimate deal by an NFL team, he's gone. So, it, it, you know, between the fact that that where Michigan is, and just like you talked about, the generational teams that Notre Dame had to play in their college football playoff semifinals compared to what Michigan had to play, they were handed a golden opportunity. And again, comes back, who had the more dynamic, better offense? TCU did. And it, it beat Michigan. Now, the pick six has definitely helped TCU as well quite a bit. But it looks like we potentially might be back here. Am I still here? You were. You, you are here again. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing <laughs> just all kinds of weird stuff happening with the Internet. I don't know if it's because of this weather that's going on in the area or what but there are obviously some major issues coming you know going on going on right now um it sounds like the michigan people uh rained down on our parade because they knew we were talking so much crap about them <laughs> maybe that's it you know maybe it's just as simple as that uh c-mac was asking earlier if vince's wife punished him for doing six hours of podcasts yesterday i cannot speak to that but <laughs> should we should we try to to finish rapid fire here i say so because we can at least you know for for the downloadable version we could edit out the part where you uh dropped out so i i still yeah. think there's uh some great questions on the table here i opened up the chat while you were gone and did a mini jesse q a session so. okay nice nice well <laughs> we managed to get through anyway i'm glad you make it i don't have verizon by the way <laughs> c mac has been on you about your internet connection it's been quite funny he said that the Just... cat pissed on your ethernet cable and i had to inform him that our mother or my mom <laughs> your wife would never ever allow a cat in a house i don't think that's right <laughs> that's exactly right okay so I tell you what, um, let me let me ask you this. So I'm wearing this T-shirt. I don't know if anyone's even noticed it. It's I'll move the microphone here so you can see it. This is 10 years old this week. This is from the BCS championship game, which you and I both attended. The 2012-2013 BCS championship game between Notre Dame and Alabama. And I've heard people say that you should never wear like hats, t-shirts, sweatshirts, you know, whatever memorabilia from big games where your team lost, whether it's the World Series, the Super Bowl, college football, whatever it happens to be. Do you buy or sell that? Do you have to retire the stuff that you buy from uh, big events where your team loses? 
Oh, that's a big sell for me. I know there's no such thing as a participation trophy, at least in my books, but your team making it there, uh, you know, I have tons of stuff from that season. I have, you know, things I brought back with me. Um, you know, it, it was, I was rocking South Beach, Derek. I was a fresh, <laughs> like, junior in high school, running around in South Beach, met some kind of famous people. Um, but, yeah, I, I, there's nothing wrong with it because it's still a monumental you know, it, it's what it means to you personally. Win or lose, you don't have to be distraught about that. You can be happy with the experience of getting to go there. And that's what I'll always remember is I was able to go with a lot of friends. You know, we drove down there. We met Pitbull on the streets. Or sorry, we did, Pitbull did a pop-up concert. And we were like front row. And at one point, he like put his arms down and used our shoulders to prop himself up. We met a, a famous um, rapper in the sh- middle of the streets in downtown South Beach, uh, you know, we stayed at a hotel. The game was kind of like the last thing I remember for obvious reasons, but the experience itself <laughs> was a ton of fun. And so the last thing anyone wants to remember. <laughs> yeah. So like I, I always will keep my memorabilia, even if it's, you know, win or lose, because it's still get, being grateful for the opportunity to go down there regardless of win or loss. Yeah. And I mean, you typically like I do it. It's like you buy the stuff before the game because like you see it and you don't want the good stuff to be gone by the time the game rolls around. So you, you've got it. And then obviously it stinks if your team loses, especially if it's a blowout like that. But this is actually, I, I have not worn this shirt very often, but I was, I was reaching in the closet today and I was like, you know, what the heck? I haven't, I haven't worn that in a while. This is the 10 year anniversary. I'll throw it on. I completely agree because it's still, it's still like a you know a big moment just your team getting there. Like I went and saw the Royals in the World Series when they made it in 2014. They lost that one to the Giants, but I had like my hat and the t-shirt and all that stuff. Fortunately, they won the next year, so like that stuff you wear a little bit more often. But still, it's like it's a, it's a big big moment when your team gets there, and you you shell out a lot of money to buy that stuff and to go. So I don't think you just pitch it because they lose. You might not wear it quite as often put it back (laughs) put it back all right td okay so this is the last question tonight and there was a little bit of controversy earlier this weekend and i just pushed the wrong button on my screen here just like technology does not want to help me out here tonight um so there was some controversy Coming out of the Notre Dame women's basketball team's 85 to 47 win over Boston College Sunday. Longtime TV analyst Deb Antonelli was doing the game on the ACC network along with play by play announcer Jen Hildred. So Antonelli said some things about Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron that upset Olivia Miles, who tweeted about it. Now I'll read the tweet. Here in a few minutes, but I'm going to play the audio of what Antonelli said first, and then we'll talk about it. So this is what Deb Antonelli said. It's in the third quarter of Notre Dame's blowout win over Boston College, and she kind of veers into a different line of conversation than maybe you're used to, and this is what upset um, Olivia Miles. So have a listen. To what Deb Antonelli said during the TV broadcast Sunday. Well, Miles is flashy. Citron is not. She is solid. And she is an excellent basketball player. She handles. She passes. She sees the floor. She can score. She understands personnel on the defensive end. (laughs) It'd be interesting if you pulled the coaches in the ACC, like... Which player would you rather have, Miles or Citron? I think it'd be a really interesting conversation because they're both so good. I think there'd be a lot of coaches in the league that would really prefer Citron. Hmm. That is interesting. Well, I mean, because Miles certainly produces at a high clip. I mean, she leads this Notre Dame team in scoring, rebounding, assists, skills. It's always a triple-double threat. Does have some turnovers that come along with that that flash, that flair that she loves to play with. And Citron named ACC Freshman of the Year last year. I mean, she's a 50, 40, almost 90. She's 88% Mm -hmm. from the the free-throw line. So that's why I say, when you look at her efficiency, her numbers are 
about, you know, her. she's just a better shooter than Miles is. Miles is a better passer. It's interesting, though. I think it would be a, maybe I'll take a silent poll, the man on the street kind of poll, and see what, what, what I can come up with. Well, who would you take if you were coaching? Well, I like Citron. I mean, I, that's not to diminish my like for Olivia Miles. It's just that I think I would take Citron because of all the things, the way she shoots the ball. Here comes Miles. They're both capable of being first team all ACC, but not both of them could be an All-American. Only one might be, maybe. And I think because of the flash and the attention and what Miles does for Notre Dame is probably giving her a little bit of an edge in the LIV system, but not much. It's good conversation. Yeah. She picks up the offensive foul on that play. She was a first team all ACC selection last year, an honorable mention all American by AP. And that and that's not saying anything negative about Miles. It's just a preference, I think. Now I'm gonna pull the coaches and see what I can come up with. <laughs> I mean we got Kenny Brooks's boat named. We can at least pull we the did. coaches and find out, <laughs> you know, who who they would prefer. Um, you know anonymously not giving up see look at that play this is drawn with a dot Smooth. to the bucket <laughs> yes and making it very clear that there is as you've said utmost respect and these are two tremendous players this is a great choice either way and, and so that was jen hildreth there at the end who it seemed to me, if you're listening to Jen, the play-by-play -play announcer, she was trying to avoid this conversation as much as possible, but uh, Deb Antonelli kept pushing this conversation. And so here's what Olivia Miles tweeted about this after the game. Quote, pinning two teammates against each other is uncalled for and creates unnecessary tension where there doesn't need to be any. We are one team and we all work to play for the better of the university Everything else does not matter. Go Irish, end quote. That's from Olivia Miles. And here is Antonelli's Twitter response to that. Quote, talk about Olivia Miles slash Sonia Citron conversation about two good players. Didn't say anything negative about either. Listen to conversation and hear subjective commentary, not negative. Which player would you pick if you only get to pick one, Olivia or Sonia? Who would coaches in ACC pick, end quote. So, Jess, there's a lot there. You got to hear. I think that the context of this is important. That's why I played, you know, an audio clip that was a little bit longer than we typically would. So you can hear what Deb Antonelli was saying. You've played sports your entire life. You know, you've been on a lot of different teams, you know, youth, travel, high school, college, the whole thing. So my question is, do you think what Deb Antonelli was talking about here was appropriate conversation for a game broadcast no i don't think that it was appropriate conversation for a game broadcast but here's what i'm going to say i i enjoy the discussion about the players but i don't think you have to narrate it in a way that pins them against each other why are we not talking about how great they are in unison together exactly. and how they complement each other's game that's the only i think everything is okay until she starts talking about well, who would you pick? Or it basically where you have to decide between one or two. I think exactly. the commentary and the subjectiveness is fine. You're highlighting what both players are good at. You're highlighting maybe kind of the what some of the minor deficiencies that both players have. But there's no reason that you need to draw a line and say, if I, you know, as an ex coach, this is who I would pick and I'm going to run a poll of who I would pick. It should be talking about how they work together, and what they are able to provide the Notre Dame team and how they contribute to Notre Dame's overall success as a team. That's exactly right. And here's how I come at this, because we obviously live in a Twitter hot take world where everyone has an opinion, and that's fine, but we see those opinions shared all the time. So it doesn't feel that unusual to see and hear these kind of opinions and takes. But it's the time and place that we're hearing it. I've been doing play-by-play -play and working in radio, you know, doing talk shows in, for almost 30 years now at this point. And I don't know exactly how many games I've called in that time. I'm probably pushing somewhere around 2,000 or so games that I've called in those 30 years. 
And never in any of those games that I've called did it ever cross my mind to look at a team with two good players and go, well, which one of those two players would I rather have? They're playing together. You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose which one you'd rather have. Just like you said, it's how they play together. My first season calling Notre Dame women's games was when Neil Ivey was in her last year, her fifth year at Notre Dame, when they won the national championship. You know, she was the point guard. Ruth Riley was an All-American center that year as well. And never did it come into my mind to say, well, who would you rather have, Neil Livey or Ruth Riley? Or, you know, Alicia Retai, who is one of the better three-point shooters in the country. Or Kelly Seaman, who is, you know, a great power forward for that team as well. Those kind of questions are not for game broadcasts, for one. They're not, you know, th those are for hot take shows and for sports talk shows. Like, it's one thing to have that conversation if you're on, you know, again, like a hot take show or a talk show like this, it serves no purpose to anyone to compare two teammates to each other on the same team when you're on live air calling a game with a microphone in front of your mouth. Because Olivia's right, all it does is serve to, to drive a wedge between teammates who, by the way, get along great and who played with each other before they ever committed to Notre Dame and who've got great chemistry playing together, you know, to what you're talking about. Talk about how they how they go together, how they work together, how they complement each other, the way they know each other. You know, that's what you talk about in the broadcast. And to go even, you know, so far as to say during the game that she would actually pick one over the other. Right. That was where it went crazy. Yeah. What all she did, she has given up all appearance of any objectivity going forward when she talks about either of these two players now, Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron, because viewers now, you know, viewers already have their own notion of announcer bias and, and all this stuff when they watch a game. And so now what Antonelli has done is told everyone that she has full bias toward one player over the other. And so what if Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron went out and did a poll of their own and they asked coaches and players, who would you rather have call your game, Deb Antonelli or Jen Hildreth, who again were, you know, were the two announcers calling this game together? You know, what would that create some friction between these two? You know, once once those results go public or even once they start talking about it, not to mention the ego blow to whoever comes up on the short end of this whole thing, you know, because again, I've called a ton of games in my life and there's always a chance in a game you know that it's going to turn into a blowout and you know I've had people ask me well what do you talk about when the game gets ugly you know when it turns into a blowout or well, first and foremost it's about preparing for the game itself as much as you can have as much information as you can for that broadcast in case that happens so you've got more things to fall back on and it's about the game that's in front of you still. And it felt to me like the game got a little bit lopsided early. It's still in the third quarter, which, by the way, Boston College played their best quarter of the game in the third when, when Deb Antonelli goes into this stuff. But she either had nothing else to talk about or she had determined before the game that this was what she was going to talk about when the game got lopsided. If that happened to me, that's th those are the two only choices. And so there are a lot of things that I would, you know, talk about on this show that I wouldn't talk about during a game and vice versa and comparing two teammates to each other. I just I can't think of any time where I've watched a game broadcast and I've heard this, you know, like go all the way back to Bobby Hurley and Christian Leitner, like and, and or, or Grant Hill. Did anyone say, you know, like, well, would you rather have Bobby? Hurley or, or, or Christian Leitner? You might say, would you rather build a team around a point guard or a forward slash center? You know, that kind of thing. I just, I, making this kind of comparison and then going so far as to say which one you would pick, I, I think is far over the line for a game broadcast. I think it's completely uncalled for. Yeah, I 100% agree. All right. I don't know where else to go. <laughs> I think we both got our rants out after that. Everyone seems to be uh, on the same page with us, and now they want it to to bleed into some Mike Bray action. What we think of Mike Bray? Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, and I've, <laughs> you know, the bonus Mike Bray question: Do you believe it's time to move on from Bray? You know, 
You want me to Mike go first? Mike Gray is a guy I've worked with. I hosted his first coaches show 20 plus years ago when you know we both came to town in his first season. And I think he has done a lot of great things for Notre Dame men's basketball. But when you look at, when you're talking about Mike Bray's philosophy has been, you've got to stay old. And then, you know, you mix some young guys into it and the whole thing, it's, it's not working. This is an old team. You've got a good young talent in JJ Starling. You had a good young talent in Blake Wesley last year, but I think that, I, I think that it's 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 gone off the edge at this point. I, I just I, I don't know how this season's going to be rescued. You know, I we I had Tom Noy on a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about would Notre Dame be better than 500 in the ACC. Tom thought they would. I just I didn't see it. And that was before these last two losses. I didn't see it. Now they're sitting here at, at 0 and 3 in the ACC with as veteran a team as he's ever had who have been together, most of them for the better part of five years. I just, it, it, it just seems like, it seems like it's, it's reached its expiration point. It's expiration date at this point. Yeah. So I I've been kind of looking at it from a, an entire picture type kind of view. And, you know, since being at Notre Dame, this is, I believe his like 22nd or 23rd season He's got a, a, a 0.65 win percentage overall, a 0.57 win percentage in conference play. Uh, he's made the tournament 13 times and only missed what seems to be the difference of years that he's been coaching. So he's made the tournament more than he's not made the tournament. So it's just to me, how far are you willing just to, to be comfortable with consistent? And I think that's the biggest issue with Notre Dame men's basketball is it seems they are comfortable with Mike Bray's consistency, but unfortunately Mike Bray hasn't done anything besides those back-to-back -back elite eight appearances to, to really show you that they could win the entire thing. And so yeah, and you I mean, play for consistency, you play to win it every year. Unfortunately, it hasn't been, you know, the only consistency has been, you know, a downward trend in the last few years with the exception of last year where they got back to the tournament and that was great. And you're hoping, okay, maybe this program has returned a corner again. Maybe there's some new life, but it, we're obviously not seeing that right now. There were so many close calls against some inferior teams against, you know, let's be honest, a pretty weak non-conference schedule. And now look where they are right now. 0-3 in the ACC. And, you know, you've lost to teams like Florida State and to Syracuse who are not that good. Those are, those are wins that you needed to have if you were going to be competitive this season and it just really seems like it 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 might be time for a new voice and kind of you know like a new a new energy around the program and it's nothing nothing personal because i mean i think everyone in the media likes mike bray you know he's a good guy he's always treated us well and you know all that kind of stuff and he's he's done so many great things for the program but look at where you know digger phelps did a lot of great things for the program too in his time. And eventually it was time to move on from Digger Phelps and Mike Bray's become the program's all-time winningest coach. And, and maybe it's time to, you know, to start a new chapter with Notre Dame men's basketball. Yeah, it sure seems like that is unfortunately where it's headed, because like you said, Mike Bray is a, a great person. He's a, he's a great coach, but you know, being those things doesn't win you games and in a business where you have to win games and that's what you're, judged by you know i just i think it is time to put in serious consideration of moving on from bray yeah all right well that's going to do it for tonight thanks again for your patience everyone for for the <laughs> internet issues that i had here unfortunately was able to get back in and and get things rolling once again jesse hope you're feeling better soon and uh, we'll talk to you what on thursday vince will be in tomorrow with uh, the mailbag show. So we'll have the mailbag show and of course, rapid fire tomorrow as well. So uh, hit the like button on your way out. If you haven't already hit it, subscribe rate and review on your podcast platforms. And we will talk to you tomorrow on Ivy nation sports talk.